All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cultish, Entering the Kingdom of the Cults. My name is Jeremiah Roberts, one of the co-hosts here. I am joined by Andrew, the super sleuth of the show, up in your super secret headquarters in Utah. How you doing, man? I'm doing better than I deserve. It's a wonderful day out here in Utah. There's a little heat wave going on, but I can't wait till it starts getting cool later in September. So doing well. Awesome. I'm super, yeah, awesome. Good to hear that, man. Super excited. And also I'm here with Dan Tate. Good to have you back here, man. Yeah, thank you. Give yourself, give everyone the quick 25 second mini bio just so people kind of know who you are in case they haven't heard you on any of the previous episodes. Sure. Um, shortest story possible. I was a active practicing Mormon for about 28 years of my life. Um, and there came a certain point where I stopped believing. I reached out to Pastor Jeff out on the streets, uh, talked to him on the corner of the Mesa Temple, just kind of asking questions, trying to understand true Christianity. From that point, I was uh, attending Paul Gia for like two years, and then I've been a guest on here a couple of times, and here I am. Awesome. Awesome, man. Well, I'm, I'm sure that you're glad to be on here today. <laughs> yeah, uh, I am definitely. super excited because we have someone on with us today that we have been a fan of for a long time. We have a really deep appreciation for, and a lot of the work that she has done has even been very impactful for our ministry and how we go about things here. Uh, we are here joined by Sandra Tanner. Uh, Sandra Tanner, it's good to talk to you. Yes, I'm glad we finally worked out the kinks and I'm able to be on. <laughs> awesome, awesome, fantastic. So uh, I'm really excited. Uh, a lot of people have reached out to us. Uh, we are going to be talking a little bit about today about the uh, Lafferty Brothers uh, that was depicted in the recent Hulu series, Under the Banner of Heaven. Uh, we had a lot of people reach out to us when that series on Hulu dropped, and I thought about reaching out to you because you had made a couple of posts about your involvement with the show. Uh, or at least, uh, can you just tell everyone about what was that like? I mean, what, what, on what level were you involved uh, in the show? Did you consult? Did you kind of give people ideas? Let everyone know about that real quickly. Well, I was consulted about temple ritual and about the temple underwear. And uh, it's known around town that I have samples of them from different eras. So the producer wanted to see what the garments would have looked like in the 80, 1980s when uh, the murders happened to have an idea of just exactly what the Lafferty's would have worn or ceremony gone through or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they, they sent a film crew down and uh, uh, I guess the wardrobe person, and they came down and filmed my various garments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so I had a pair that was from the 80s. And so uh, you don't get much of that actually in the film. I don't know if they had more and they cut it out, but when they show Brenda standing in the bedroom, when it looks like she has a slip on mm -hmm. before the shower scene. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, that's the woman's flare leg garment that she has on that they photographed at my store and then made a duplicate of it. But so, so what I contributed was very small to the overall picture of the story. Of course, they had Krakauer's book and a, a host of ex Mormons mm -hmm. that they were consulting with. So yeah. they didn't need a whole lot from me. Okay. Hey, what's up, everyone? Have you ever wanted to get behind the microphone? and chat with myself and Andrew, the super sleuth of the show here at Cultish. Well, guess what? You get to do exactly that this October, October 27th through the 29th at ReformCon. It's going to be a great and awesome live conference. There's going to be a lot of great speakers. So if you want to get behind a microphone with myself and Andrew, the super sleuth of the show, go to reformcon.org. Get your tickets right now, October 27th through the 29th. And can't wait to meet you all there and have a great conversation. Now back to the episode. And now you have an expanded, you've been in Utah for a very, very long time. For anyone who doesn't know about you, can you get the quick Cliff Notes LinkedIn bio of who you are and what makes you some of an expert on this whole subject that everyone was enamored by with this series? Well, my husband and I are both from fifth generation Mormon families. And when we were in our late teens, we each in different situations were challenged on the historic claims of Mormonism. And through our research into those pro kind of problems, we ended up leaving Mormonism, became Christians, still hung onto the Book of Mormon for a couple of years until finally God led us down the road to see that that didn't make it either. It wasn't just mm. Joseph and Brigham that were the problems. And then uh, from that, we started publishing our research. And uh, my husband died in 2006 of Alzheimer's. 
and I've continued the ministry since then. And we have a little bookstore here in Salt Lake, uh, but I am getting ready to retire next mm. year. <laughs> and uh, But through the years, we have talked to thousands of people leaving Mormonism because mm. of our writings. Okay. Yes. I, excellent. Yeah. I've actually been to your store a couple of times. I was just there recently, a couple of months ago. It was a great to chat with you for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. So a lot of people know the whole story of the Lafferty brothers. They're kind of introduced to it through the show. You have a ministry that goes back several decades, uh, as you just mentioned. When was the very first time you heard about the story of the Lafferty brothers? And what was the atmosphere like in Utah with, with, in which this was all happening? What, what was your perspective on that? Take us into that if you could. Well, the uh, Lafferty's were kind of coming in in the middle of the turmoil with the fundamentalists in the uh, time period. The uh, Irville LeBaron crowd was uh, famous before this with the murders that Herbal did down in Mexico and then up in Texas and different places like that. So the polygamist or fundamentalist Mormons had been in the news for uh, the last 20 years before the Lafferty's came along. They were one of a string of people or men claiming to be God's true prophet, the one mighty and strong, the one that was going to set the church in order, the one that was going to restore everything to his glory. And uh, so from a uh, researcher's point of view, the Lafferty's were one of a string of fundamentalist murders. And uh, they certainly um, were a, a dangerous uh, duo, the two brothers, but they weren't the last of them. More stuff has happened. It's, it's just Joseph Smith and Brigham Young put out teachings that when taken to their ultimate extreme, would lead them, lead followers to commit murder. And it doesn't mean all the polygamists are murderers. We don't need afraid of all of them. <laughs> they aren't out to kill everyone. But these killings related to the temple ritual of where you had for years in the temple, the oath of uh, swearing on an oath to not reveal the secrets, not to fight against the church, to be faithful and all those things, uh, lest your throat be slit. And so there's a undercurrent of um, this idea of people being killed for uh, disobeying God. So we see this in the um, Lafferty murders where the one sister, uh, sister-in-law, is uh, persuading the other sister-in-law to leave the group uh, and helps her to, where did she go to? Uh, Florida? Was it Florida she went to, I think? Yeah, I think it and, was. Yeah, and uh, so that made her an apostate, which would have brought her under the curse of the temple oath of uh, offering your life as a sacrifice to have your throat split for revealing and helping people to apostatize. So that was Brenda, Brenda's big sin is apostatizing from the apostatizing from the true church, fighting against the true prophet, of course, in this case was Lafferty, um, not the regular Mormon church. And uh, there is this undercurrent in Mormonism that produces these violent acts. It doesn't mean all the Mormons are violent, and it doesn't mean that you need to be afraid of your next door neighbor. It's in these extremist cults that take it so letter of the law serious on all these covenants they make that gets some of them to this extreme measure of murder. But then I guess the question would be, were they already a little unstable mentally and more susceptible to ending up killing someone? But I just want to emphasize this isn't all the Mormons. Right. Hey, everyone, if you are watching us right now on Apologia Studios YouTube channel, you need to know that Cultish would not be possible if it wasn't for this studio. So if you want to support Apologia Studios, which also makes Cultish a possibility for you to enjoy every single week here on YouTube, go to ApologiaStudios.com. 
You can become an all access member and you will also get a lot of great additional content, which will also help support the studio, which will allow cultists to be a possibility as well on a weekly basis. So we thank you all for watching us. And now back to the episode. I, I have a question for you, uh, Sandra. So going back in like uh, LDS history, if we think about uh, the Missouri war or even uh, Joseph Smith having the army of the Lord of hosts, which rivaled the United States military at that time, was there any uh, beliefs of Joseph Smith that uh, are kind of consistently being played out with modern fundamentalists, like uh, in terms of restoring the kingdom of God on earth with Doctrine and Covenants one, section 132 or anything of that nature? Well, it was a gradual militarizing of Mormonism and becoming more radical. Uh, at the start of Mormonism, I don't believe Joseph was promoting uh, anything that radical. But as they got thrown out of different towns after they had experienced uh, some of these um, attacks on their own people, like the Hans Mill massacre, there's things like that that push them into this ideology of uh, we're the persecuted true followers of God and finally to the point that we need to protect the kingdom of God. And we're going to go into a forced submission to the kingdom of God. So they become more radicalized as the uh, Mormons are thrown out from place to place. Of course, the Mormons never asked why were they thrown out from place to place. But um, <laughs> <laughs> there were reasons they were expelled from different places. They had their own bad stuff going on on their own camp. Um, certainly, it was taken too far by both sides. But when Joseph set up the temple ritual in Nauvoo in the 1840s, by then he certainly was much more militaristic. He had set up the uh, Nauvoo Legion and made himself, um, what was it, uh, Lieutenant General of the Nauvoo Legion. <laughs> and there's paintings of him on his horse holding his sword up there, charging out, you know, it looks pretty militant. So it was a growing militancy in Mormonism. And then when they came West, uh, of course they're fleeing the law and they leave the United States. A lot of Mormons seem to forget this. They weren't supportive of America. I mean, they left the yeah. United States and came to Mexico. And by a quirk of fate, the next year, uh, the United States acquired the territory and the Mormons were back under the rule of the United States which caused conflicts because they wanted to have their own law and their own rule in Utah, which was just a territory at that point. And uh, it put them direct in conflict with the government um, that led to all sorts of problems. It was part of the problem of having the Mount Meadow Massacre when uh, Mormons killed a bunch of immigrants coming through the state, well, the territory. Mm -hmm. and yeah. So it's a long history yeah. of... Uh, conflict and wars or whatever you want to call them. Hmm. Dan, did you have any thoughts or what are you thinking so far? Yeah, there was a specific question regarding the Lafferty brothers. Um, Sandra, you may be aware of this, kind of tying into this the whole topic of uh, the throat slitting thing that was going on in the temple. Um, in a uh, I can't remember what year it was done, but Jeffrey R. Holland was in an interview with, I believe, uh, BBC, where they were asking him, were there penalties? This was right around the time that uh, Mitt Romney was going for president. And so they were asking Jeffrey R. Holland, were these penalties in the temple? Were they in the temple? And, he, and Jeffrey finally admits it, that they were, but they're not anymore. So the reason I'm even bringing this up is just one to validate that we have appropriate authorities of LDS uh, confirming this, but the question I wanted to offer to you is we would kind of look at the Lafferty brothers utilizing this principle in an extremist, radical type of way. Are you aware of any way that the LDS church would look at this slitting your throat in, in a, I hate saying an appropriate way, but is there a right way to look at this in the LDS faith? Was there ever a time that the LDS ch church executed this themselves? Like, what, what would be the difference between the right way to look at that and the extremist way, which would be Lafferty's? Any thoughts? Well, under Brigham Young, it was not a church 
instituted practice. Uh, okay. I mean, it's not like where you have uh, uh, Catholics running um, Spain or something. You know, <laughs> it, it, it was an uh, official program of the administration. However, there we have stories of bishops who sanctioned blood atonement in cases where the man committed adultery repeatedly and the church leaders in his area told him he had gone too far and the only way he could get forgiven would be to have his throat slit. And uh, I mean, I can't prove it from a court in case because uh, they didn't go to court on any of it. Uh, but I believe we can document early examples under Brigham Young of people who had their throat slit for disobeying the church. But that was not done through an official channel that would go up to the top of the church. It would have been a local thing that would have been done. Okay. And this was, in this whole uh, throat slitting thing was eradicated, I think around 1989 or somewhere around there. Would you have an idea? Uh, well, well, Okay, you got to watch how we word this because yeah. people will think they were slitting throats up till sure, then. Sure, sure, sure. Of course. Okay, they were not slitting throats in the 1900s. Uh, they, it, it, the, the temple ceremony had an oath in it uh, from early days that uh, you promise not to reveal these things on the threat of death of having your throat slit. Yeah. They modified it to where it wasn't as gory as the original wording in about 1912 or something. The oath where you symbolically in the temple drew your thumb across your throat to symbolize ways that life could be taken was in the ceremony until 1990. They wow. were not slitting people's throats up until 1990, <laughs> they were doing the motion yes. of it in a uh, pantomime uh, in the ceremony of the ways that life could be taken if you broke your oaths. Gotcha. So they're taking out 1990. Okay. Okay. So the problem we have with this nowadays is that everyone that went through the temple ceremony after 1990 may very well tell you you are crazy and listening to horrible liars because they've been through the temple for years and they never experienced this. Yeah. Well, right, because they went through after 1990. Hmm. We have tape recordings of it beforehand. I mean, there's no doubt that that was in there. Yeah. I, I mean, I, all the Mormon historians will concede that those were part of the elements of the ceremony before 1990. Mm -hmm. What what prompted Sandra the changing of the temple? Was it a PR thing? Was there was there a, a new was there like a news, uh, like a sixty minutes expose of sorts? Or what was the catalyst for then? I think it would have been Gordon B. Hinckley who would have been the president uh, to remove those. What what was the story behind that? Well, I don't know the uh, inside details, but Gordon B. Hinckley was a PR man. He understood public relations better than anyone they've ever had at the head of their church. He came up with all kinds of ways to utilize the media that was available. At this point, they're starting to get a lot more converts that don't have any Mormon background, uh, that weren't brought up in a Utah area where they had some familiarity already about Mormonism or something. Mm -hmm. He's trying to sell it to the nation so he starts this big program, We Are Mormons. And uh, so he has this big video campaign where you have Joe the plumber, say, I do plumbing, blah, yeah. blah, blah, and I'm a Mormon. And so <laughs> they have this big campaign. Well, they did surveys of their own people and came up with the conclusion. I, now I'm guessing at this. I know they did the survey. The question is what they made of it. But evidently after they did the questionnaire of their members, they realized that people had a problem with the temple ritual and certain aspects of it. So the next year after taking the big survey, uh, they changed the temple ritual. And I think there's a direct connection for this. So I assume that as a PR leader, he realized this was a negative for new converts coming into Mormonism that came from a Christian background where they had a nice pastor, for instance, 
that when they saw in the temple ritual, the pastor making a deal with the devil for money, that some people would have been offended by that. Yeah. And, and so I think all these changes they did in 90 in the ceremony were all in relation to new converts not being offended when they went through the ritual. So they hmm. won't get outside and say, oh, my word, what was that? I'm leaving, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a question for you, Sandra. You, I noticed, I think I overheard that, uh, maybe it was from, I was chatting maybe with Eric Johnson, uh, who recently, who just uh, is about to publish this new book, Introducing Christianity with, to Mormons. And he yeah. had mentioned to me that ever since the series has come out, you've gotten quite a bit of people, you've gotten quite a bit of attention your ministry has. Is that correct? People have been reaching out to you? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I guess I have a question in relation to that. I noticed that a lot of the videos of young Mormon influencers who are reviewing this series, they are constantly trying to categorize what was depicted in the miniseries as this really extreme, not just extremism, but even this is a distortion of original Mormonism. Uh, and they are trying to articulate that in their videos. Is there any a similarity between the people reaching out to you? Did you have people reaching out to you who are Mormons who are maybe upset trying to justify or, or explain away things that are problematic or maybe people who are generally struggling with maybe uncovering these teachings? Or what was it like with people reaching out to you? People have reached out to your ministry. Well, they see the video and uh, it's kind of like, you know, what the heck? I, I think these guys are crazy to put this film out. And so they go to Google. Yeah. Google is the gateway to apostasy because any topic you hear on Mormonism, if you Google it, you're going to find real history, not the Mormon PR version. And people will come in and talk to me and say, I had no idea that the Mormons ever taught some of those things. And they're horrified. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them have family memories that finally made sense to them of uh, discussions with their uh, grandma or grandpa or something. And so it's been interesting and been all kinds of things, but I have not had hardly any Mormons give me pushback. I think the Mormons have given up on me. <laughs> and, so they don't come harass me anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but I talked to a lot of people that it was for some, the very beginning of their examination of Mormon claims, because mm -hmm. they just were sure this was all being made up. Yeah. And until they Googled it and they realized, oh, my goodness, mm -hmm. there's a lot of research on this topic. Yeah. So I have a question. Uh, it's another thing. There is a, I'm going to give a bit of a spoiler for the series. Uh, so not only did you uh, give some consulting for the show, there's an Easter egg inside of, I think, the third or fourth episode where the main protagonist goes. And I'm a spoiler alert if you want to not get spoiled. You haven't watched it. Skip forward a couple seconds. I think you know what I'm going to talk about, Sandra. The main character, portrayed by Andrew Garfield, uh, goes into a car all by himself because he finds this big red book. That big red book just so happens to be your uh, classic work that you and Mor uh, Gerald did, Mormonism Shadow Reality. Uh, so question, how did, the, how, did, how did you work out with Hulu to have that book make the cameo? And do you think that what you saw depicted in that scene is maybe relevant for a lot of the Mormon experience when someone all of a sudden sees anti-literature for the first time, kind of the other edge, the paradigm being shattered of a sorts, or what are, your, what are your thoughts on that? I did not know they were going to show our book, especially not in the actual storyline, Yeah, and have this poor guy sitting all night reading our book and going through a crisis of faith. <laughs> well, the next day, I've got all these people streaming into my store do you have the red book? I've got to have the red book. We sold right out of our printing and it really uh, was inconvenient because we didn't think we had to reprint that book for some months down the road. And suddenly we're thrown into a whole different printing schedule yeah. uh, to get that book reprinted. But yes, it was phenomenal how many people called and said, was that your red book? Was that your book? I got to have that. So uh, thank you to the producers of the film. Uh, we appreciate all the cells. <laughs> it was a great success. Yeah. Um, I got a, I got, I got a question for you, Sandra. So you mentioned something a little bit earlier, uh, the one mighty and strong, I think that's in doctrine and covenants, uh, section 85. 
Uh, what what led to the FL not not the FLDS? My apologies. Uh, let's say fundamentalist Mormon groups to believe that the one mighty and strong is someone that's returning to bring the church back from apostasy. Like what what occurred in history to make uh, certain sects of people think that the mainstream LDS church went into apostasy? Because I could see, uh, for example, getting rid of the that one oath with the, you know, the slitting of the throat motion that's done within their temple ordinances, uh, that also being like an impetus for people to think, well, what else has changed over time? Like, what was the main thing that started creating these different branches and groups, uh, splinter groups out here in Utah? Well, the splinter group started at the, what, uh, two years after Joseph started his church because <laughs> Joseph Smith kept changing and revising his doctrines and bringing in new things. That's one of the problems when you have a cult leader that gets to get new revelations all the mm -hmm. time, uh, things are gonna change. And so as Joseph Smith started getting bigger and bigger ideas of what he could make of this church, I, I mean, in the beginning, he never envisioned all the stuff that happened. Uh, it's just got away from him. And one thing you have, when you have a cult leader leading something, that goes by the cult of personality. You have to keep up with that ante. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the big blitz bang for today. Well, people get dissatisfied. You got to have another big thing. Okay, yeah, here's the latest revelation. Here we're going to do this thing, and he keeps adding and adding and adding. Uh, and when you do that, they're going to always go off track and go into something crazy. So Joseph Smith starts changing things. He puts out a new printing of his revelations in 1835, two years after he did the Book of Commandments, and his revelations are rewritten. And so this is a process that goes on and on, new teachings, new revelations, new changes, and people were getting upset about this. And the early witnesses to the Book of Mormon were upset about all the changes he was bringing in. Mm. And so uh, you had splinter groups in the 1830s starting not over polygamy, they're just over the changes of doctrines that happened at that time period. So when you look at Mormonism through Joseph and Brigham's lifetime, you have the beginnings of dozens of splinter groups that feel the church leader went off track at a particular year, and everyone's got a different year when he went off track. And so uh, the early splinter groups weren't over polygamy, they were over doctrine, over end time things, that sort of stuff. Then when you get Brigham Young, then you got splinter groups because the church, because they don't want to give up polygamy and the church is moving towards giving it up. So when the church gives up polygamy, supposedly gives it up, in 1890, you have all these splinter groups then that develop. The church has gone into error because it's given up polygamy. Mm -hmm. So it's funny how you get all these groups. And so there's a whole book out, uh, Divergent Paths of the Restoration, where this guy lists the hundreds of breakoff groups of Mormonism. So it's, uh, I, I kid with some of my Mormon friends, you know, if the whole point of Joseph Smith was to unify the church because everyone is splintered into so many denominations in standard Christianity that we needed restoration, I tell them, it, it, Joseph didn't help. He created a whole new, we got hundreds more splinter groups now. We were better yeah. off without Joseph Smith. If yeah. the problem was the splintering of Christianity. Hmm. Dandy, what do you what are your thoughts? So what are your thoughts on this? One of the original things that comes to my mind is um and Sandra, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I guess what I would personally define, which could be correct or wrong, but the the original split, which was when Joseph Smith died and Brigham Young was trying to take the leadership spot, and Emma Smith was saying, you know, her, sh her son should take the spot, and then they divided. Um, there, was, there was a po portrayal in the series, Under the Banner of Heaven, that it, they kind of portrayed Brigham Young as somebody that wasn't necessarily setting Joseph Smith up to get killed in Carthage jail, but that he was kind of lying and waiting for it, like he was waiting for his opportunity to jump up, um, now, me as a missionary, when I had served through 2009 to 2011, uh, this was right when the Joseph Smith Prophet of the Restoration movie came out. It was about an hour long. 
and it showed that this amazing relationship between Joseph and Brigham and and that Joseph somehow uh, had revelation that he needed to actually lay his hands on Brigham Young's hand to like bestow the priesthood specifically to Brigham. Um, and that even got changed. There was a second edition where they removed that. Um, but where my question's coming from is, do you have any recollection or have you had any experience in the history of Brigham of whether he was really waiting for Joseph Smith to die so he could really jump the gun? Um, does that make sense? Like Joseph Smith's relationship to uh, Brigham. I don't see that. I thought that the video picked up on a rumor that some people are passing around that Brigham planned or was a part some way of bringing about Joseph's death. And I, I wish they hadn't put that in because it's just, it's uh, setting things off on a different track that I think mm. just confuses the story. Okay. I don't believe he uh, was involved in trying to get rid of Joseph Smith. Okay. And he, no, go ahead. And he wasn't the first problem. I mean, Joseph Smith kept giving a uh, saying who was going to be a success a successor. And it wasn't Brigham. It was going to be, uh, Oliver Cowdery. It was going to be Hiram Smith. Uh, I mean, not Hiram, um, Sidney Rigdon and Brigham Young. Uh, and it was going to be his son. Joseph at the end is saying his 11 year old son is his designated leader. So it all was, it was left in confusion. It was an open opportunity for Brigham to step in and take leadership. But I think the stars just aligned in the way that just opened the door for him to step into that role. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you no go ahead yeah Sandra so you you're mentioning that aspect of that scene from under the banner of heaven where they kind of threw that in there and given they are a TV show they're making television they're making yeah. entertainment and sometimes that can yeah. be done at the expense of historical authenticity in throughout the series you see the journey of the Lafferty brothers and how they get radicalized specifically by entering into what was known as the school of prophets um, I'm curious just to know was there how accurate was that was Lafferty's journey from being a, a traditional Mormon to being radicalized? Was there a, elements where you think it was over thematic? Does mean given the nature it's a miniseries? Um, and maybe just to tell everyone too what the School of Prophets was and how that affected the Lafferty oh, yeah. brothers. Well, you have this. Uh, well, there's these different movements behind the scenes around here of. Uh, the, especially amongst the fundamentalists of uh, looking for this one, Joseph talked about the one mighty and strong to set the church in order. Well, they see all kinds of things they don't like in the church today. So it just increases the rhetoric going around of where's the one mighty and strong. Oh, I heard that the, this guy down in so, you know, Centerville or somewhere is uh, maybe he's the one mighty and strong. Here's this other guy that's having a revelation. Maybe he's, they're all looking for this solution in some person that'll step forward and solve everything. And um, at the time of the Lafferty stuff, there were stories, rumors going around about School of the Prophets. Uh, I didn't know that much about them, but I heard rumors about, you know, there was this little group, but there were a number of different splinter groups with all kinds of rumors about their different leaders. Uh, I, when I look at Lafferty's father, I know a lot of people around here were saying, oh, I didn't even recognize uh, this as typical Mormon. I, it, I never even met anyone that sounded like that father. And I'm sitting there thinking, I got relatives that sound like him. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I don't know. They're, they're hanging around with a lot more liberal friend, uh, family than I am. Yeah. Uh, because the father's rhetoric would have been things I could have heard my grandfather say. Mm -hmm. Granted, it wouldn't be 1990s Mormons, but it's back when uh, my grandparents were alive back in the 70s, I could have seen my grandpa give them that kind of thing that the father said to his sons. Mm -hmm. So to me, it, it sounded right for the time, for being part of the polygamous movement, all was believable to me. Yeah. Also, uh, I'll let you guys jump in too if you have any thoughts as well, but uh, in the film, as Andrew Garfield's character, who's the detective, 
is proceeding in this investigation and this crime that was committed by the Lafferty brothers, there seems to be a continued conflict of interest, not only with him being someone who's a devout Mormon, but also people within his uh, precinct, uh, people who are uh, in his church, who are even his spiritual leaders, who are trying to control uh, him and the narrative that's being depicted about the Lafferty brothers' connection to Mormonism. Even though, the, again, even though it's cinematic, is that, is that an accurate reflection anyway, do you think, of just the culture within uh, the Mormon hierarchy, not just, not just bishops, uh, people of a regular ward or stake president of, of, the higher, of the bigger hierarchy when you're looking at the Quorum of the Seventy, the Quorum of the Twelve. Do you think that was an accurate uh, kind of depiction of Mormon culture in general? I, I don't know how I would put that. Uh, early on, the church leaders obviously saw the danger of one guy just uh, shooting off at the mouth and come up with some crazy idea and, and stick them all with this decision. So at some point they started uh, getting much more corporate that the in-house discussions that didn't go out of the room and there has to be a hundred percent agreement on what way they do. You can't have these kind of charismatic uh, leadership deals, just let them go wild because they'll come up with crazy ideas that you don't want to be a part of. Yeah. So years they've tried to refine this to have control over the leader. Um, I don't know how uh, the current president got that thing going about getting rid of I'm a Mormon, but him and uh, Hinckley were at different ends of the spectrum on this. Hinckley puts this whole I'm a Mormon campaign, spends millions and millions of dollars on all these films for the Internet about I'm a Mormon. And then Nelson gets up in conference and says, oh, no, we use the name Mormon. Uh, that's mm. giving a big Satan and change. That. I'm not like, what? Yeah, <laughs> I remember that. Would put this mm. all in place. And so I don't think he ran that by the committee. Um, I, his film department must tore their hair out when, he, when they heard that one. <laughs> yeah. Because they had to go back and spend millions to revise all their videos to take I'm a Mormon out. So uh, Nelson's a different fish. I mean, he he's dangerous because mm. he dreams at night and thinks it's a revelation. And he gets up in the morning and just announces things. Mm. So uh, it's been kind of interesting to see how his role as prophet was different than Hinckley's. Because right. Hinckley was a PR guy and was trying to make Mormonism sound normal. Hmm. No, he's trying to sell Mormonism as normal, but he doesn't know, he doesn't have the PR savvy that Hinckley did to know how to do that. So he comes up with some odd decisions. Mm -hmm. And then stepping away just from the series, uh, what was the, what was it like for you uh, during the early 80s when this, when this, these murders took place? Not just for you, but just the, uh, what was the, just the nature in general in Utah against just the, Com the cultural conversation, because at that time, the percentage of non-LDS versus LDS in the population of Utah, it was a lot more higher Mormon. Uh, what was that like? How were they kind of dealing with it? What did it look like in the news? I mean, how did that look like compared to well, what was depicted in the series? Well, there was, it just seemed like every decade you had some other crazy Mormon story about polygamous murders or... Um, some uh, polygamous stuff going on. Uh, I mean, I got in front of me our newsletter back in uh, March of 85, uh, number 56, called Blood Flows in Utah, uh, about the Lafferty's. But then I got another one here from 2003, uh, and this is number 101, Wanted, One Mighty and Strong, Fundamentalist Charge LDS Church has Fallen into Apostasy. Well, then we move up to the Hoffman stuff, uh, 2010, issue number 115, the Mormon murders, 25 years later. I mean, it's just uh, our career has been going through and talking about all these different decades, how you have a some sort of major story every 10 years yeah. <laughs> of, of either murders or polygamous that have uh, all gone amok some way or another. Hmm. 
Hey, what's up, everyone? We love that you are enjoying our content on a weekly basis, but this program cannot continue and wouldn't be possible without your support. So if you want to go to thecultistshow.com, there is a donate tab. You can either support us one time or you can become a monthly partner with us that will allow us to continue this program, allow us to continue to be salt and light to the kingdom of the cults. So please go to thecultistshow.com forward slash donate and you can support us one time or monthly. Also, make sure you check out our merchandise store. Go to shopcultish.com. You can see all of our great designs. A lot of you have gotten merchandise from us already. So again, either go to shopcultish.com and check out all the awesome merch. Back to the show. You um, see, I was thinking about this prior to uh, coming on with you. And I think I talked with you, Dan, also with uh, Dandra. I talked with you as well. There's another series that you made an appearance on recently, the Netflix miniseries Murder Among the Mormons. And yeah. uh, just tell us about that real quickly. How did you get involved with that? <laughs> um, well, that's uh, all on the Hoffman thing. And yeah. Mark Hoffman in the uh, uh, early, was it the 1990s? Uh, Roughly around then, yeah. He was inventing a bunch of documents that he was claiming were written by different early Mormon leaders like Martin Harris or Joseph Smith or his mother, Lucy Smith, and different people like this that would be worth a lot of money. But then some of his fines fine, uh, would be on documents that would be embarrassing to the church, things that would tie the Smith family more closely into magic and money digging and uh, like uh, crystal ball gazers. And so the church had this dilemma of, um, d do we accept these as authentic? And of course they don't want to accept them because they all went in their, against their claims. So the Mormon church had had uh, the FBI and different people do forensic stuff on these documents. And it looked like, uh, it was pointing to them all being authentic. Well, Gerald, my husband, had uh, done his own investigation of the literary content of the different documents mm -hmm. and had become convinced that Mark Hoffman was inventing these documents, that they're forgeries. But everyone was against us, um, including the FBI on their forensic people and the LDS church people and Christian people, because they wanted the documents to be authentic. And here's Gerald standing out there all alone. No, I think they're made up. I don't care what you say. I think they're mm. frauds. No one would listen. And uh, so uh, a year later, Hoffman gets in financial difficulties and ends up killing a couple of people as part of a scheme to get out of his debt problems. And then the whole thing comes out in police investigations that, oh, by the way, yeah, the documents are forgeries mm -hmm. and Mark's a murderer. So it was a big, big story. Um, because Gerald had been the first one to publicly go in print questioning the documents a year before the murders, uh, we got mentioned in all of the paperback books done on the Hoffman case. Uh, because Gerald becomes a sort of man bites dog story. It's not the story you'd expect. It's the guy that should be championing the documents who's saying there's something wrong with them. So we got written up in all these books. So when they started to do the film, originally, the filmmakers were going to make that a part of the film of Gerald's question of the document. And they interviewed me for hours on all this. Hmm. which are all on the cutting room floor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because evidently when it got down to the nitty gritty of putting the series together, they just evidently decided to go with the boilerplate outline of true crime drama that you see on TV. Mm -hmm. And the way true crime stories go generally is you have the family and friends interviewed at first oh he was the most wonderful guy yes he yep. was just a you know, head of boy scouts blah 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 and then then they then they tell about this murders or whatever it is and then you interview the family and they all say oh i couldn't believe it i never in the world would have thought that he would have been the one that would do that okay that's the three-part general way of telling 
uh, documentary on uh, these kind of murders. But we follow up the narrative because along the way before, when everyone's saying, oh, he was such a wonderful guy, they got to mm -hmm. have one protagonist here to say, no, I think he's a real jerk. He's making this stuff up, you know? Mm -hmm. and so it doesn't fit the way they want to tell the big picture. So yeah. our part got cut out. And that's how I end up with these two short little <laughs> cameos <laughs> where I'm stuck in the film and it doesn't make sense why mm -hmm. I'm there because they cut everything else out. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Dan, Andrew, do you guys have, what are your guys thoughts? You have any questions you want to throw in there? I have, I have some questions about, uh, bringing it back to, uh, the Lafferty brothers in the situation. I know that one of the big, uh, impetuses for Dan Lafferty was that a uh, little pamphlet tract called the peacemaker. I think I'm remembering the title correctly. Yeah. Uh, wh what exactly was that? Who wrote that? Was it written by Joseph Smith? Uh, what, what did he write it under a pseudonym? Like Sandra, what do you know about the peacemaker tract? Oh, that you're getting back to some really early years on that. <laughs> I don't know if he actually wrote it or worked with somebody to write it, but he had to know the person that did if he didn't write it. And it was a kind of a feeler about polygamy and, uh, then it got everybody upset. So that, oh, no, no, I just printed that up as a print job for somebody. I, I didn't have anything to do with it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure he did. Whether he physically wrote it or not, I don't know. But he certainly was fully aware of who did and that he wanted it to print it as a uh, introduction to the idea of mm -hmm. polygamy. Yeah. So you can enter in Google the mm -hmm. peacemaker and Mormonism, and you'll find a site that tell you about it. Okay. Oh, all right. Thank you for sharing that, Sandra. So one of the reasons why I just thought to bring up uh, Mark Hoffman and the other doc in the Netflix documentary that you were a part of, um, you guys can let me know this too. I see a commonality between the two, between the Lafferty brothers and Mark Hoffman, because both of them involve crimes that were committed, uh, that which you just mentioned, Sandra. And then uh, also it, involves Mormon revisionist history and what I what I've observed in just our my amount of time kind of just viewing Mormonism as it's evolving is that the the primary church is becoming more progressive and as a byproduct of that they're kind of abandoning a lot of the fundamentalist aspects of aspects of Mormonism and what I've seen as a consequence is a lot of the fundamentalist groups or fi fringe groups or spin-offs are using that to their advantage to exploit that and to say that the official church has gone amok, has gone astray. The restoration needs a restoration, which is a catalyst for them to radicalize. Do you think the current state of Mormonism, where things are at in Utah specifically, could cre has the sort of uh, cultural mixing to create another uh, situation like the Lafferty Brothers or create another Mark Hoffman? What are your thoughts on that? Well, they, uh, the Mormon church always faces the problem of somebody out there in the fringe groups rising up to claim they're the one mighty and strong. That's a very deep embedded concept in at least generational Mormon families. And uh, I think that's becoming less prevalent as the younger generations come up. What we're finding with a lot of the younger people today is they don't even care about any of that. Uh, and they're just very pragmatic about, oh, it doesn't affect my life, who cares, you know? And so the Mormon church is changing. Uh, I don't think it's moving towards Christianity. It's moving towards some sort of amalgamation of whatever you want to believe. Uh, and the younger people don't, they aren't as engaged on uh, worried about whether it is the old brand of Mormonism. They just are concerned about, well, it works for me, who cares? So I think that the group that would be affected by the claim of I'm the one mighty and strong is a shrinking older crowd of Mormonism, but they'd also be the ones most likely to be converted into the polygamous groups. But younger people more and more seem to be uh, just generalizing everything. Well, you know, it's close enough and we're better than you. It doesn't matter if we're absolutely 100% true. We're close, we're better than you are. So, I mean, you know, we're like 80% true. You guys are only 
Mm-hmm. And, and it's just more relative from the younger people. But people 50 and above, they got that old lying uh, belief system embedded in their souls. Of, right. Uh, there's going to be a one mighty and strong come along to set things in order. And that's why they got so excited about Mitt Romney, as they were sure he was the coming savior for the nation. Hmm. Any Mormon that runs for office is immediately, oh, here's the one yeah. mighty and strong, you know. Yeah, especially if you are really adhering to the White Horse prophecy, for example. Mitt Romney yeah, right. would be very convenient when the Constitution hangs by a thread, wink, wink, <laughs> for any of you who know. Uh, Dan, do you have any thoughts? Do you have something you might right now? Uh, the only uh, – something that kind of ties into both uh, the shows, Under the Banner of Heaven and then the Mark Hoffman series, something that I've been deeply interested in that I've kind of heard you comment on before is kind of the closed doors PR moves – uh, that we see specifically in Under the Banner of Heaven, that might be the best example to kind of give you a target to shoot at. Um, when some of the, I believe the younger brothers are in the jail, uh, Detective Jeb uh, sees somebody walk inside the door, and I believe it's either an Area 70, maybe it's a Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, I didn't catch their name, but it was definitely somebody high up in the church, and comes in and just basically... Uh, you know, makes some comments like he needs to get these guys out of here and tries to convince Jeb, who's a current Mormon, that we need to save the face of the church or the the um, the common image of the church to the public. And so in your experience, how accurate were those um, presentations of the church responding to this? Was there a lot of things behind closed doors where Mormons would be like, oh, my gosh, I had no idea they'd they'd try to hide this stuff that they didn't want people to know about it? Um, Like, does that make sense? Because that was one of the things. Yeah, go ahead. I could envision that scenario. I don't know how true it is. I mean, I I don't have personal knowledge of, um, you know, how their inner workings would have been in those cases of whether they would have come to jail like that. Hmm. I can envision it in a Mormon setting as being uh, gone in that way, but I don't know that it was uh, someone would have gone in to talk to them about uh, not hurting the church image kind of thing, uh, especially with them being apostate. I mean, if it was if it was like a bishop that embezzled funds, I could see them going in and appealing to his loyalty to the priesthood to not make this an embarrassment to the church be sure you make it clear it's just you and uh, don't bring any bad light on the church or something mm, but i gotcha. don't know with apostates if they would have made an appeal to them hmm. they don't usually like the polygamists that much <laughs> yeah <laughs> right to be doing private deals or conversations mm-hmm. Yes. And in the spirit of explaining things away, <laughs> um, yeah. a lot of times people will see things depicted like under the banner of heaven, and maybe they'll they'll come across the big red book. And I think just right now, the way the Internet is, it's very easy if you have confirmation biases. It's easy to also jump on Google and try and find things that reinforce you. So somebody will look up you know, quotes by Brigham Young talking about, you know, three, if you find a wife caught in adultery, be better to throw a javelin through her like that, that quote, that, like that from Journal of Discourses or just any of the other extremes or looking at what is depicted in the Mountain Meadows massacre. It's very easy for someone to go and find something on fair.org, any LDS apologist who, apologist who try and explain those things away. Um, what would you say, because that's depicted in the series as well, too, what are some of the counter arguments that LDS apologists will bring up, even though they don't, they have to put the disclaimer, they don't officially represent the LDS church. What are some of the arguments they bring up to try and explain that away? Mm. Um, and then what would you say are some counter arguments you've seen in your time in ministry? Cause that's a real centric point of the series. Well, they, when it comes to anything that happened in pioneer days, they just want to say, oh, it was part of the times. You have to understand they were persecuted people and they'd been driven out. They'd lost so much in Illinois and Missouri that, of course, there would be radicalization of people. But that's not the church. It's not the spirit of the movement. It's not the spirit of Joseph Smith. Uh, that was. Uh, you have to understand it in the extremes of the times. So they want to make it all like um, it was just a fluke or something that that developed that way into something dangerous. Not that the teachings itself 
would have led to that. Mm -hmm. But when you see the temple ritual, when you see the different revelations and sermons, um, that's all the flavor of Mormonism. I mean, the militancy, by the time they came to Utah, was there uh, to have got the Mormons convinced to go to war with the United States or anyone. They just were, had been, their leaders had brought them to a point of very militancy of uh, we're the good guys, everyone else in the world's against us, and we have a legitimate right to fight back. Mm -hmm. But the church historians want to play it all down as, oh, we were just victims of the time. Anyone would have done the same thing in the same situation kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then um, I really appreciate you taking the time, again, Sanford, to, to talk with us. And uh, Dan, I'll let you jump in, too, if you have thoughts. But uh, I think also when we're looking at this, these types of Mormon history, this ends up creating a crisis of faith that, again, that was depicted by Andrew Garfield's character, again, when he's reading your big uh, red book. And the majority of people who do end up losing their faith, they usually end up going to, into some form of agnosticism. Uh, and yeah. Dan, just tell tell Sandra real quickly the very cliff notes of your your experience because it, yours wasn't looking at the big red book, but it was looking at the book of Abraham. Let tell Sandra real quickly about that. Oh man, it was. I mean, first off, Sandra, I had run, I had ran into some of your work back when I was in high school, and some of those things I had printed off, and they had metaphorically stayed on the shelf for twelve, fifteen years after that. And, you know, something happened in the family that kind of caused us to doubt some things. Those were kind of small things that didn't matter. And then I finally decided to take all of my big questions that I've kind of always put in the back of my head down in front of me. And how it basically turned out is really similar to a lot of other ex-Mormons where you kind of get this idea of, well, I have always believed that the LDS church is true. Because what other church has 12 apostles, has this, has that, has that. So if this isn't true and I've really lost faith in this, then I guess no other church is true. Because, uh, you know, something that was very specifically said to me and not in a derogatory sense at all is when I had very first reached out to Apologia and had some questions, they had said, the, it sounds like you have a lot of Mormon baggage, like that you still have the Mormon glasses on. Like you're still looking in the world, looking for the things that Mormonism wants you to look for but you don't agree with the things Mormonism has. And so just that that dilemma alone threw me into a down, downward spiral of just complete godlessness. I, I was agnostic, hated religion, hated Christianity. Um, and then there was just a couple of random videos that I came across that could have been yours. A lot of them were Jeff's that I finally just reached out and said, I'll give Christianity another try. And once I actually understood what Christianity was even about, I, I had no idea. And I spent two years in Jacksonville, Florida, in the Bible Belt, and I had no concept of what Christianity was, as I was still looking for a Mormon replacement and didn't find it, and that mm -hmm. turned to agnosticism. So, yeah. Yeah. I guess so. I guess in light of what Dan has told you, for the people who reach out to you, both in your time of, of at Utah uh, Lighthouse Ministry, uh, both in relation to the, the recent explosion of everyone looking for the big red book, but also just throughout the years, you like I said, you've had thousands of Mormons reaching out to you. A good majority of them do end up becoming atheists or agnostic. Like, how yeah. do you? I think of almost. I think of the analogy of a burning building. That burn. That building is coming down. That worldview is coming down. And I, I've almost seen your ministry as the two firefighters with a net to try and catch them. Yeah. How, yeah. again, as we wrap up here, and again, thank you for taking the time, Sandra. What, what, have, what did you and Gerald do, even when you were together and now, what did you do to try to help them not lose faith all completely, but actually fall into biblical Christianity, into not, yeah, what, tell us about that. Well, one thing that I try to uh, engage them in a discussion on uh, why they are so easily uh, turn to walking away from the Bible and from Christianity. And I mentioned to them that just as you have now found out that the Mormon church misrepresented everything about their own history, have you ever considered that they are the ones that fed you your view of Christianity and the Bible? My position would be just as they misrepresented Mormon history to you, 
they have also misrepresented Christianity and the Bible to you. Hmm. And that means as much of a uh, rethink as you have done for the problems of Mormonism. Uh, They say the most outlandish things to me that guys that are educated, you know, and they'll come in and say, oh, well, the the Bible wasn't even, uh, the New Testament wasn't even written until 300 AD. And I'm like, what? Uh, No. (laughs) Oh, yeah. yeah." I said, no, I don't think so. You know, (laughs) but they just, they have no knowledge of manuscripts for the Bible. They, I talked about time that seemed to think of it as a game of gossip, Mm -hmm. that the Bible was written down in uh, Hebrew, some of them think the New Testament was Hebrew, but, uh, and uh, Greek, and then Latin, and then German, and then French, and then uh, whatever other languages, until 12 languages later, it comes out in English. Mm-hmm. And I said, no, it didn't work that way. <laughs> I, I said, you can go to school, learn Greek yourself, do your own translation. Yeah. It's, it is, you don't have to rely on this mm-hmm. uh, guy 20 people down the road on the translation process. So we try to pull them back into the fact that they have just dismissed the Bible without even looking at what a a Christian is saying about it. They just assume that what they always thought about the Bible was still valid, even though they saw the Mormon church wasn't. Mm -hmm. So we try to get them back to uh, what are the evidences? How would you establish that an ancient document was really authentic? And the Book of Mormon certainly doesn't meet that. You don't have any people group, any land mass. You don't have any maps. You have no artifacts, no sample of the language. And uh, it plagiarizes the King James Bible, which is a little clue. Mm-hmm. But they don't even think that one through. Yeah. So. And when you go to the New Testament, we have all sorts of ways that we can go back and establish what the earliest text was. And all indications are that the text is essentially the same. There's been no major doctrinal shift change in any of the documents. Yes, there's a few different verses like in 1 John that you could talk about, but they don't change the major fabric of Christianity. Mormonism has changes that literally change the direction of what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. They reverse themselves on doctrines. Mm -hmm. So I try to challenge them to go back and look at some material on the New Testament, that there are reasons to believe it. Hmm. Do you guys have any any last thoughts as we kind of wrap up here? No, I'm good. I have a a last question. I don't know. It could be uh, a long answer to the question, Sandra, but it seems like when people are leaving the LDS, uh, there's like three options, let's say. They go to agnosticism, atheism, and I'll just uh, compile that with like new age spirituality and other Mm -hmm. religions, right? And then there's also biblical Christianity. But then there's this fundamentalist realization that there are people that actually just say that the modern church is an apostasy. They hold on to the Book of Mormon and they're waiting for that one mighty and strong. What separated you and Gerald from becoming uh, fundamentalists? Like you held on the Book of Mormon for a while, but how come you guys didn't turn uh, to polygamy? Oh, well, we, we come from polygamous families. Uh, we got all kind of horror stories. About how <laughs> got it. So that was not, it, we never considered the polygamous arguments. Yeah. We focused on the Book of Mormon in that it was the first thing Joseph Smith wrote and brought out as the word of God. And so we thought if God called him at all, then the Book of Mormon was the first thing he did. It's got to be the litmus test. Now, it never occurred to us to use the Bible for that because you're raised to know it's not that reliable. So, okay, we're going to take the Book of Mormon as the litmus test. If it's not taught in there, we aren't going to believe it. Well, you read the Book of Mormon, it's only got one God, one heaven, one hell, no pre-existence, no work for the dead, no temple marriage, no three levels of heaven. So we just threw all that stuff out and only believed it if it was in the Book of Mormon. But then the more we read the Book of Mormon, the more we realized it plagiarized the King James Bible all through, that the Nephites couldn't possibly have read, Mm. and that there was something wrong with this. So we finally had to give up the Book of Mormon. But it was because we went out through the Book of Mormon, not from later teachings, that kept us closer to biblical uh, openness. Mm. Okay. 
No, thank no, thank you for sharing that. And just one last thing, real quickly, uh, is that you, with all your ministry, you mentioned thousands of people coming into the door. I'm sure you've got a, a couple of colorful stories of interactions of people walking through your door throughout all the years. Is there one or just one example specifically of just maybe a two minute cliff note story that you could just tell of just an interesting story of when someone walked through your door, one that you kind of tell that would just uh, for our uh, audience? Well, for uh, just a few years ago, I had this young woman come in that was coming out of one of the polygamous groups and uh, she had left the polygamous group and got married to an LDS guy, but that hadn't worked out. She now was dating a fellow from a polygamous group that had um, been involved in polygamy, but was now uh, seeing there were problems with all of that. She brought in him and they weren't married yet. They just came in to see me. And he comes in, this big burly guy, and he's got his arms folded across <laughs> his chest. And she wants me to talk to him about Jesus. <laughs> And uh, and he's all just scrunched up there, you know, you know, just try it. And uh, anyways, he was defiant. I don't know if I say defiant, smug. He was smug about everything and just made a joke about the whole discussion of truth because um, he thought he already had it. Mm-hmm. Anyways, as the time goes by and different uh, discussions with me and other Christians, Uh, Finally, the guy comes back in, and he's just this nice, uh, congenial person that's ready to talk about the whole issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, a few months later, they both at our church were baptized and gave these just glorious testimonies of how God had delivered them from these generational polygamous family groups and that they were taking their stand for Christ, and they knew it would cause uh, waves in their polygamous family, but they stood for Christ, and uh, so here we are several years later, and they're still standing for Christ. So wow. we're just thankful for what God's doing here. Wow, praise God. And then uh, as we wrap up here, you recently had a book that was written about uh, a lot of the adventures that you and Gerald had in your ministry. Uh, Just tell everyone real quickly about that book and where they can get access to that. We'll have links in our description when we drop this episode. Yeah, the name of the book is Lighthouse. Gerald and Sandra Tanner, uh, what is it? Despised and Beloved Critics of Mormonism. Hmm. And it's our life story about all the crazy things we got involved in, lawsuits, FBI, CIA guys. I mean, just, just a lot of different prophets we've known. So mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, our biography is for sale on Amazon and everywhere like that, but they can get it through our website hmm. at utlm.org. Okay. So it's I- like that. Excellent. Excellent. All right, Santa, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, if you guys are hanging around, we're going to do a- Andrew – uh, Dan and I, we're going to do kind of like a little aftermath, kind of giving our thought, our own thoughts in the series and also giving our aftermath in the conversation. Sandra, thank you so much for taking the time. And if you guys enjoyed this episode, definitely leave a comment on our social media. Let us know what you thought. And there's always a program like this cannot continue without your support. So if you want to support Cultish, you can go to the cultishshow.com. There is a donate tab. You can donate one time or become a monthly partner with us. All that being said, we'll talk to you next week on Cultish, where we enter into the kingdom of the cults. Talk to you guys soon.